Hello and welcome again to Digging for Gold, How to Study the Bible for Yourself. I'm Corey Collins and on behalf of the Keller Church of Christ, I am excited to have you with us once again. As we begin this time, let's remind ourselves of the importance of digging for gold and the awareness that what we're going after is precious and valuable and meaningful and lasting and more to be desired than anything that this life has to offer. There are so many resources available. There's a new website for the Serving and Sharing blog. It is servingandsharing.com. If you'd like to look there and also the other videos from this class and other presentations you'll find at the YouTube channel there at the top of the screen. Have you ever been spelunking? Some would call it cave digging or cave crawling. When I was a student in college, I belonged to a social club and we guys would go every so often on a Friday and Saturday to explore some cave and this beautiful spot in Vietnam, look at the light, look at the colors, look at the glory of it. Wouldn't it be worth whatever it might take to be able to get there and take advantage of it? Oh, Spelunky, to discover something that God has made that's maybe deep in the earth and to do that together so that we can say, wow, look at this. Have you noticed that? So in this process of uh, digging for gold, it's kind of like we are going deeper and we're going farther and some of the spots are wide and easy and comfortable and then we might get into a, a narrow opening where many people would say hey this is a really nice cave i've enjoyed it i'll see you all later i'm going back but then others will say you know if i could just kind of squeeze through here there's going to be something on the other side that's very much worth finding and so there are those that are truly devoted uh, to this to this process well, when you go into a cave, you got your light and you got your tools, you got your equipment, just like studying the Word of God. It's not something to be done in a haphazard way. It's not casual. It's not easy. It's planned. We prepare for it. We pray for it. And as we go, we might find that, hey, we're getting into something uh, that we hadn't anticipated, but we've got our light on and we're eager for what might lie ahead, but we're cautious. We're humble, and we realize that this is something God has given us that the Lord has made. And so next thing we know, we could be all the way in, and how do we get out again, you see? So uh, spelunking, cave crawling, is a little bit like studying the Bible. It's wonderful. It's precious. There's nothing like it. And once you discover something rare, something you hadn't uh, uh, identified before. You can't wait to bring it to the other spelunkers and, and say, hey, look at this. Isn't it great? So we're talking about interpretation. What does the Bible mean? First, to those that received that letter or that history or that exhortation or that prophecy. And so as you open your Bible, overall, remember that certain things come first. Not everything in scripture is flat. It's all inspired down to every jot and tittle, every last mark and letter, but even the, the Bible itself recognizes that certain things get top priority. When Jesus was asked, what is the foremost, the number one commandment? You remember he gave two, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength, and the second, similar to it, Love your neighbor as yourself. And then everything else that God said hangs on these two. So if you love God, these are the things you will obey and follow and pursue. And if you love your neighbor, this is the way you will treat him or her. So in the Ten Commandments, the first four have to do with the Lord God uh, regarding no images, no other gods. Uh, uh, revering his name, not taking it in vain. And even the Sabbath under the old system was part of that. And then the remaining six commands about no adultery, no theft, no murder, no false witness, no coveting, that kind of thing, that all expresses the uh, 
outworking of the second command. But this is first. So nothing in the Bible that we're told to do can be more important than what Jesus said comes first. In Matthew 23, 23, he chastised the Pharisees because they tithed, uh, gave a tenth of these plants like mint and dill and cumin. And he said, you've neglected the weightier matters of the law, what we sometimes call the, the big stuff or the big rocks, love and justice and mercy. He said, these you should have concentrated on without neglecting the tithing rules that they had. And then you remember 1 Corinthians 15. Here's the gospel I preached that you've received, that you've accepted, that you're standing on of first importance. Christ died for our sins. He was buried. He rose the third day, according to the scriptures, and he appeared. And the rest of that chapter says, you know, this is item number one. Or if you see a, Jesus saying, seek first the kingdom of God in Matthew 6, you might just go through your Bible and identify the word first or more than or greater than. Keep things in perspective. Then also note in, in your overall approach, those life or death issues. You know, we're familiar in John 3, Jesus said, unless one is born again uh, of water and the Spirit, it's a reference to baptism. The context makes that clear. That person cannot inherit, cannot enjoy, cannot receive eternal life. It's life or death. It's this way or that. John 8, 24, unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. So those things that the scriptures call uh, vital, do this or die, uh, this is what God expects. He will accept nothing less, nothing else. Be sure that you identify those things and pursue them. And of course, they're not always stated in exactly this way, unless or if not, or you must or you have to. Sometimes you can infer, you can pull this out from the text. For example, Matthew 25, when the, uh, Jesus separates the sheep from the goats at the judgment, and he tells the sheep that they're going to uh, the kingdom, of God, they're going to be at home with him eternally because uh, I was hungry, I was sick, I was in prison, I was thirsty, I was naked, I was a stranger, and, th and this is what you did. And the goats that are rejected and lost in hell, you did not do these things. So you could interpret from that, these are life or death essentials. Caring for the hungry, the thirsty, the poor, the naked, the, uh, the sick, and those in prison, and, and so forth. So keep in mind, first things first, and life or death essentials. Now, in your interpretation, you're going to focus on one thought unit. We're narrowing down now. It could be a parable. It could be an event, a speech, a miracle, a paragraph, a prayer. It could even be just one sentence that contains an idea, but it's a thought unit so you can see where it starts and where it ends. And as you focus on that, you may want to diagram it. That is to draw out the major pieces that are contained there. Uh, who's doing the action and what action is involved, the main subject and the verb. And then you're going to see uh, other parts of speech. You're going to see supporting terms and you can place those under those main ideas. Well, let's give an example. That should say Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. It's one that you're familiar with. Here's what one person did. Uh, he made a, a diagram of, of this beautiful passage. And he started with the word for, for you're saved uh, by grace, through faith, not from yourselves, God's gift. He's highlighted in bold key words. He's underlined some terms. And you see how making this visual, because many of us do learn by seeing more than we do by hearing or even just by reading. So you want to engage uh, your strongest senses in, in putting together what you see in the scripture. And then you might 
make an outline. God saves us by grace. God owns all the credit and glory. And God creates us in Christ for good works. And so by grace, through faith, unto good works. Those could even be your three points. And then you could put sub points under that. And next thing you know, hey, you have a lesson. It's from your digging, your um, observation, and now interpretation. And of course, you would explain that by faith means the whole faith process in terms of hearing the gospel, repenting, confessing Christ, being baptized, uh, etc. Now, before we go on, I want to be sure, because my time is running out in this class, we only have two more sessions after this one, that I talk with you about something that is so very crucial as you and I seek to understand and interpret and present to others the Word of God. In this religious age in which we live with so much confusion, various doctrines, traditions, practices, fads, innovations, uh, how do you know when you read the Bible what is authorized and what is prohibited? Is God telling us you must do this, you are allowed to do this, you mustn't do it? Uh, how do you recognize in your hermeneutics, your interpretation, uh, what God is telling you to do or not to do? Well, we're going to talk about with the only source being scripture, we eliminate a lot of problems right there. Unless we have a thus says the Lord or something implied by uh, the word of God, we're not going to consider it. But then once we get to that point, we see there are three ways that uh, God gives us authority for what we are to do. The first is direct statements, and we'll uh, spell these out in a moment. The second is approved examples. And the third is necessary inferences. That is, there are those things that God has clearly stated. And there are those things that God tells us. Someone, let's say the apostles, did such and such, and it was the right thing they did. That would be uh, an approved example. Go and do likewise. Or there might be a necessary inference where God uh, tells us something we are to, to pursue. And in order to do that, we recognize that certain other things have to be part of the process. So let's think about these for a moment, just briefly, because our time is so short. Interpretation involves recognizing the direct statements that you find in the scriptures. The first would be those imperative commands. Do this. So Acts 22, 16, arise and be baptized. There are many times you can see in plain print uh, specific instructions that are addressed to those that want to follow Jesus and want to be in heaven, and there's no mistaking it. There are some people who think that's the only way the Bible tells us what to do, and they minimize some of the other things that we will discuss, and that's very sad because these direct statements include more than just commands. The second uh, element here is declarative statements. There might be a, a fact in the Bible that implies something that we are to do. Here's a direct statement, Acts 2.41, and I'm using easy ones to make the point. Those who received his word were baptized and they were added to their number. Is that simply telling us that something happened, or is it telling us what we are to do if we want to be saved and have eternal life? We must receive the word, we must be baptized, and we will then be added to the same church we read about in the New Testament. We won't join the church like some denomination or some community church group. We'll be added to the same group of people to which they were added. It's a statement that implies direction. And then third, there are questions, interrogative 
uh, things that we can read. For example, Romans 6, 1 to 4. We talked about this in a previous session. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. What is that telling us? Do not continue in sin. You died with Christ when you were baptized. You were buried. You were raised again. So you must not. You, you, you cannot. Don't do it, even though it's stated as a question. Even a prayer, may the God of peace equip you, Hebrews 13, 20 and 21, is telling us uh, to, to pray and what to pray, how to come before God, and what to ask for when we petition Him. So as you're interpreting, look for commands, look for statements that declare those that ask and those that uh, express a prayer. Well, let's notice a few more of these. Uh, sometimes the Bible exhorts us. We call this a hortatory statement. And the book of Hebrews, we sometimes call the, the lettuce book, kind of like a head of lettuce, just a play on words. But often Hebrews will, will tell us something uh, that's true and then say, therefore, let us. Hebrews 10 talks about how we have a great high priest over the uh, house of God. He's in heaven. He's interceding for us. He died for us. He's alive again. He's reigning. Therefore, let us draw near. So that's telling us. It's, it's like a command, even though it's not written that way, draw near. And then we're familiar with uh, verse 24 there. Let us consider one another to spur one another on to love and good deeds. It's telling us that's what we are to do. And verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. That is an exhortation. And it carries the same weight as if it were a direct command. Then we have the conditional uh, remarks in the Bible. Uh, if you confess me before men, Jesus says, I will confess you before my Father, Matthew 10, 20, 32. What's the direction there? Confess Jesus. And it, he's not just talking about the time of our baptism, as important as that is, but he's talking in Matthew 10 to his original followers about their going before the authorities and facing hostility and persecution and rejection. You mustn't be silent. You mustn't be ashamed. If you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you. So this if then or unless uh, gives us uh, something uh, like a command authorizing us as to what we're to do. Sometimes the Bible will use a wish statement. May it be or may it not be. Galatians 6, 14. May it never be that I should boast in anything except the cross of Jesus Christ. Instruction. Don't boast about who you are or what you've accomplished or how important or special or whatever. Don't focus on yourself. All the credit goes to God. So boast in the cross of Jesus Christ and in nothing and no one else. Then, last with these direct statements, what if Jesus is telling us a parable? And here this prodigal, wasteful son has gone to the far country. He's blown it. He has nothing left. He's, he's willing to eat what the pigs eat. And he's there, and, and he, he came to himself it's like a light. I'll go back to my father's house, and I'll ask for a job because his employees have bread to spare. And I'm starving in this distant country. So what is Jesus telling the sinners, the lost people in the room to do? He's telling them to come to themselves, to stop feeding the pigs, so to speak, that they're welcome to, to repent and obey the Lord and come to the Father's house. In the same story, he talked about the older brother, so resistant. He didn't want the younger one that had uh, messed up so badly to be allowed back into the fold. What's Jesus telling the Pharisees in the room? If you look at Luke 15, one and two, there are some 
pious critics there. And he's telling them, don't reject the lost person. Don't be the obstacle. Don't make them get past you in order to reach the Father. So what we're talking about in interpretation is that many times the Bible tells us what we're to do or not to do through the use of direct statements. And that these may be commands, but they may also take other forms as well. Well, let's go on to think about something else that should be obvious to us. And we noted a few minutes ago that some people reject uh, anything that's not a direct command, you must do this. And so they don't uh, recognize the validity of approved examples. But the fact is, if the apostles did something that pleased God, that honored God, that obeyed God, and the Bible commends them for what they did, we are to do the same. And that's why we say approved examples, because obviously we're not going to follow the example of Judas Iscariot or Simon Peter when he disowned Jesus three times. So in the context, uh, we see what someone did and we say, wow, of course. Uh, they devoted themselves in the early church in Jerusalem to the apostles' teaching, the breaking of bread, the fellowship, and the prayers. I know these matters are very basic. And most of you watching this at this time, you already know these things but I want to emphasize them so that when you are digging and searching and exploring, you will note, and you may be in your uh, lines on the side, your interpretation, you may be right down in, in that column. Uh, direct statements, approved examples, necessary inferences, and this will be a tremendous tool for you. We could say, before we go any further, that these are the same ways that our parents teach us and taught us. They gave us direct statements and questions and exhortations and prayers and wishes. They also uh, used examples as to what uh, we were to do. Now, in the Bible, the bad examples, you can learn from them what to avoid just like you learned when your brother or sister disobeyed and they were punished for it, uh, disciplined, that you weren't going to do likewise. But anyway, here are some uh, other examples. Act six, these widows needed to be fed. So choose seven men. They, they served in a deacon type role. So that's the way we approach a need in a congregation. We appoint qualified, spirit-filled, godly men to handle that task. We call them deacons. Philip joined the chariot where the Ethiopian was, and he asked. So, so we're to go and find people that are seeking, and we ask questions of them. The Samaritan that stopped and held the, helped the Jewish man that was beaten, and uh, 1 Corinthians 10, Israel, in a sense, in a figurative sense, they were baptized into Moses and into the Red Sea, we were baptized into Christ in water. They went through the Red Sea. We went through the water. But anyway, after they were delivered, they perished in the wilderness. Why? Several reasons. They were idolaters. They were sexually immoral. They craved evil things. They grumbled and they tested God. And, and Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10, those things happened to them. Why? As examples for us. So we mentioned the Macedonians and their liberal giving. You're not to be like Esau, Hebrews 12. You are to follow in the steps of Christ who suffered and uh, left you this pattern. So approved examples uh, are very important for us in our study. And then the third area or avenue, that we had three paths of biblical authority, avenues that God uses. This has to do with the fact that the scriptures may imply something, but not spell it out. And yet it's abundantly clear that we must understand certain things from that scripture 
in order to uh, follow it. Jesus used necessary inferences. Mark 12, that when God said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that scripture implied Jesus inferred, drew out the implication that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were still alive. In Mark 10, the fact that God joined Adam and Eve, Jesus said, what God has joined together, what's the inference? Let man or man must not separate. Uh, in Luke 13 and 14, when Jesus would help people on the Sabbath day, he would say to his critics, well, you help your ox or your donkey, you get your son out of the ditch, even though it's the Sabbath day. And Jesus inferred from that. He said, you recognize there are certain things you could do on the Sabbath that involve effort, but they don't violate the law regarding work. So today in the Lord's church, uh, we're told to assemble. We're not told that we must have a church building, but that is one expedient, one way, one tool we can use. We certainly must have a place to meet. If we're going to sing, we must have songs to sing and someone to lead us. These are inferences. But singing does not imply an instrument. It does imply that we all participate together and that someone will assist us by leading the singing. Immersion, there must be water, a baptistry, a swimming pool, a lake, the Lord's Supper. The New Testament makes it clear on the first day of the week, Acts 20 and verse 7, we came together to break bread. So we understand that the inference is you come together on the first day of the week in order to participate in the Lord's Supper. And that's why every week, not once a month or once a quarter or once a year, the scriptures uh, make it clear that we are to preach and we are to give. We are to evangelize, go into all the world. We're not always told exactly what pieces we must use. Uh, so we're going to use the printed page. We're going to uh, take the internet and things like this uh, video presentation. We're carrying out what God told us to do. Well, the Bible calls us Christians or saints or disciples. So those are the names we're going to wear. We're not going to become this or that hyphenated type. Uh, I'm this kind of Christian or that. We are Christians as the Bible defines that term. We're saints, we're disciples. The church is led by elders or overseers or pastors and served by designated deacons, as we mentioned a few moments ago. So we want to notice when it comes to biblical authority that this is part of our interpretation and that some things God has told us directly through those eight various ways that we noted. And then in some ways, God has given us approved examples or even bad examples that we're not going to imitate and that God has uh, implied certain things in the Bible and we infer. We could say necessary, meaning that these inferences are required by the text. And because of that, we can see clearly that this or that is to be done in order to carry out what God has told us. So I wanted to make sure that we included commands, examples, and inferences in our sessions on interpretation before our class series runs out. Well, let's go back then to talk about some of the principles we've been considering regarding interpretation. So now I'm leaving aside those avenues of authority, and want to talk with you a bit more about interpreting the scriptures. Uh, I want to uh, uh, urge you to read the Old Testament in its own setting. Because we are under the New Testament covenant, we tend to spend more time 
in the New Testament. And then through that lens, through those glasses, we see the Old Testament. That's understandable. But the New Testament is the, the fulfillment of the old. So you want to see the, 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 the first story, the bottom level, on its own, and then see the New Testament as built upon it and uh, drawing out its full meaning and its implications. So the five parts of the Old Testament we talked about, each one, see it to its original audience. Genesis, for example, was written by Moses for the people of Israel living in his generation. So you should first read it that way. The same is true of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and then Deuteronomy is given to the next generation. Uh, 40 years later, now the commandments are repeated in Deuteronomy 5, and it's a new audience. It's not the ones that have just left Egypt. They're gone. It's their children. And so understand it in its own setting. Uh, the history is so important this way, too, uh, that we not simply just force all of that into only uh, the New Testament's view, uh, look light on it. Uh, but we see it for itself. Poetry, all those Psalms. We've talked about Psalm 22. David was the first one to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What did he mean? What were his circumstances? And so that's what we're trying to say. Prophecy. We want to remember that the prophets were preachers to their own time, and they often foretold the future for the sake of those living in their own era, as well as for us today. I don't know who said this, but it's so true. The New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed. The Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. So uh, you might look at the Old Testament that way. Along those lines, the scripture reveals truth step by step. Everything in the scripture is the word of God. It's God breathed. But just as we teach our children those things which are age appropriate, so there are matters in the Bible in which the curtain rises somewhat gradually as God tells more and more and more. For example, Genesis 1 certainly indicates that uh, one God exists in three persons. God created, the Spirit of God moved over the waters, uh, the Word of God, uh, God said, there's his word. And then John chapter 1 makes it, you know, even more abundantly evident that in the beginning was the Word. When God said, that that's the Word of God, and the Word became flesh. And so, uh, the, the, the nature of God is progressively explained. Same is true with the nature of life after death. And God, step by step, let his people understand more and more of what's waiting on the other side. In the Old Testament particularly, and in the New, we have what we might call accommodative language. By that we mean that the Word of God uh, speaks in ways that, that accommodate um, our daily lives. The Word of God is accurate. There's no mistake or there's no error. When the Bible speaks of the sun rising, the sun setting, that is the way the, the, the world appears to be. The, the, the weather station, the meteorologist, they still say, tomorrow morning, sunrise will be at 6.15, sunset at uh, 7 p.m. It's accommodative language, even though you and I understand uh, the sun and the earth and, and so forth. When the Bible speaks of God having hands or ears or feet and so forth, this is language that helps us understand something about God. 
The Bible also uses approximate language. When the Bible says that about six days later, Jesus took three disciples up a high mountain, or that on Pentecost, about 3,000 souls were added. And the Bible uses the word almost, or nearby, or soon. This is approximate language. Even when the Bible speaks about Jesus being in the tomb, you'll read in the Bible that uh, three days and three nights, you'll read three days, and you'll read on the third day. These are not contradictions. These are the ways in which uh, the people who first received the Word of God describe time. They just weren't as uh, down to the moment that as, as uh, our culture tends to be today. It's approximate language. And then you want to see that the New Testament is the perfect interpreter of the old. If the New Testament tells you that what was written before means such and such, that's what it means. You don't need to look any further. For example, Deuteronomy 25 and verse 4 says, don't muzzle the ox that treads out the corn. In the Old Testament setting, the animal that worked the food was allowed to eat some of the food. So you don't cover its mouth because it's actually helping to produce the crop. Well, the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 9, 1 Timothy 5, both apply that to uh, ministers, preachers of the gospel, and elders that may be compensated. And I, I, I say with a smile that preachers are compared to oxen. Those that uh, uh, get their living from the gospel may be compensated. And the same is true for elders that could be financially supported. That's 1 Timothy 5. And Paul says, in effect, that this passage is not really just about oxen, that this was written for our sake. So it interprets the Old Testament. We mentioned 1 Corinthians chapter 10, that Israel was saved and then perished. And uh, it's interpreted that we will lose our salvation. We will miss the promised land of heaven if we do what the Israelites did after God brought them out of Egypt. So there's no once saved, always saved. There's no guarantee if you abandon your faith. Now, if you keep your faith, you walk in the light, you live by faith, you're still saved by the grace of God. But if you say, oh, because I'm saved, I can practice immorality and idolatry and uh, the things that they did, we noted, you will be lost just as surely as they were lost. There's no uh, getting around it. There's no mistaking that. Well, perhaps this is a uh, good spot for us to stop. There's more we want to talk about regarding interpretation next time. And uh, we certainly want to uh, spend a, a good bit of emphasis on application. But let's notice again that once we get to interpretation, application is right there. Because we talked about how God uses direct statements, God uses approved examples, God uses necessary inferences that we see in our interpretation so that we can um, uh, know what we are to do or, or what we are not to do. So we're, we're, we're almost there uh, with application right now because we, in observation, we said this is what the text says, interpretation, this is what it meant for them, and this is what it means for us, and now that's going to take us to the so what, what will we do about it, and we're going to find ourselves possessing the gold, the treasure, the beautiful benefits found only in the Word of God. I'm Corey Collins with Keller Church of Christ. If you go to our website, kellercofc.org, and click on contact, 
You can reach us there, ask us for any of the materials or links or other resources that you would like to have from this class. I hope you'll be with us again next time. Bye-bye for now.